Well, we're back in the book of Romans again, chapter 8. And up to this point, Paul has been talking about uh, sin and grace and trying to find where that all fits into the Christian life. Some people may have thought since there's so much grace, then we can sin even more. And chapter 8 is actually going to continue with that theme of saying we are new people now and we are living under a new covenant and a new relationship. And now we've got the Holy Spirit. So chapter 8 has at least two or three different themes, maybe all connected to the same point, but it's going to help us see how we are to live now that we are Christians. So uh, in just a minute, we're going to read from Romans 8. We're going to read through the chapter. Uh, Before we do that, we're going to sing this song called We Shall Assemble at the Mountain. Following that, Mark will lead us in the prayer. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for, again, this opportunity to study your word. We're so grateful that your word is here and so readily available, and it's uh, so easy for us to read it. Uh, Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to study with other people of like mind who are interested in what you have to say. Father, help us to be interested in what you have to say, always searching your word to find the answers to the problems in our world, the answers in our life, and for the gratitude in our hearts. Father, help us to turn to you in thanksgiving and praise and help us as we study today, Father, to keep our focus on what you want us to learn. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, if you remember from Romans chapter 7, and maybe if you've not listened to that lesson, you could uh, perhaps view that one on the YouTube channel as well. Uh, Obviously, we've done every chapter up to this point, and all of it really does lead to the next point. Uh, In chapter 8 here, he begins the word, therefore, and that's going to help us remember that in chapter 7, Paul was struggling with the the flesh versus the spirit, the things that he knew he should be doing in Christ, and yet the old life and the old way was still tempting, and it was still strong, and he was seeking for victory, and he said, hey, there's victory in Christ Jesus. So we're going to read Romans chapter 8, and he begins by saying this, therefore... There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life have set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. So we So he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then, even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies 
because of His Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you will put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves, so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought you brought about your adoption to sonship, and by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in His sufferings, in order that we may also share in His glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. And we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know how we ought to pray or what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those He predestined, He also called. Those He called, He also justified. Those He justified, He also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring a charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So that chapter certainly does have a lot oh, of, my, yeah. of, you know, we could probably take three or four classes we could just, just to just to go through this so we'll go an hour and a half today we'll cover all of it in one setting there we right? go we're gonna have to move fast Peter I think this is one of those things that's just it's so chock full of uh, information and uh, affirming statements right. to me they're very affirming I read this and I'm encouraged by it because I, I see that you know God is on my side uh, you, you start off in the first sentence of uh, Romans 8 uh, therefore there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus to me that's an affirmation there's no condemnation for me if I'm in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation for you if you are in Christ Jesus. And to me, that's just a great way to start this chapter. 
There's now no condemnation for all those in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. And that covers a lot of what we talked about last chapter, didn't it? Right. So it seems like the, the way it seems laid out, there's two laws. One is the law of sin and death. That law says when you sin, spiritually you're dead. So that's where we all were, and many people still are at that point. But then now there's a new law. The new law is the spirit, which instead of giving death, it gives life. So once we were dead, and now we're alive. Once we were condemned, now we're justified. Once we were in bondage, now we're free. So it's just looking at them from two different angles, two different perspectives. And so the question really for Christians and non-Christians, how do you want to live? Do you want to live a life of death, bondage, fear, condemnation? Or would you like to live a life of freedom and of life and of hope and of future? And so choose. And wow, the choice seems pretty obvious. It seems obvious, but it, you know, for those who don't know Christ, who haven't been uh, part of Christ or haven't been buried with Christ, don't probably get it. And I think from the outside world, it could be a, a whole foreign thing. They can see what's going on in Christianity sometimes, uh, but it probably can be confusing. Right. But it's so, you know, stated so plainly here, you know, life or death, you know, which would you choose? I mean, it seems so obvious, like you say. Right. And then, so the next couple of verses, we don't have slides for those, just explains how this process happened, that there was nothing wrong with the law. The law is perfect. The only imperfection there is, is my ability to keep. God's righteous standard. And so I have sinned. And so what I could not do in myself, Christ Jesus did for me when he died on the cross. He took my place, paid the sin debt so that I could be free. So now I am righteous in God's eyes, not because of anything I've done, but because of the righteousness of Christ. So that pretty well covers, I think, three and four, that the requirement of the, the righteousness is fulfilled in Christ. And so now I am free in Christ. And verse five kind of goes into this transition. Again, the transition we were always talking about from death to life. Uh, verse five starts out, those who live according to the flesh have in their mindset on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. And the whole idea of mindset, mindset, you're changing your mind. We're talking about transition. We're talking about changing lives. We talked in chapter six about being buried with Christ, rising in newness of life. So we have to set our minds on, what's it say? Have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. So we're, we're changing, I mean, Christianity is the life-changing business, isn't it? I mean, as part of you know, ministers of Christ, we are in the life-changing business. We're trying to help people transition from death to life. And you know, having them change their mindset from being of the flesh to be in the mindset of what the Spirit desires. Verse 6 uh, talks a little more about the mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. So it's the transition of our minds. It's taking what we used to think and changing that whole way of thinking. Right. And I think this was God's plan all along, but when people under the Old Covenant, they kind of made it into just a bunch of rules to follow. There was not really a desire or or a wanting to do God's will. It was kind of either you do it or you don't. And so I just do it because there's a legalistic requirement I feel I have to keep. And this seems to remove some of that legalism to say it's, it's a new desire. And so in the Old Testament in Jeremiah, God says, I'm gonna re remove your heart of stone, which is a hard heart, yeah, follow the rules and follow the laws, but un unwanting, unwilling really to do it and, and it's just a heart of stone. And he wants to give us through the Spirit a tender heart that seeks after God, seeks a relationship with God, seeks, seeks to be in God's presence. And if I'm doing that, living according to the Spirit, I'm going to want to follow the Spirit and not follow a sinful desire, the sinful nature. And so it, it seems to be he's, the new mindset, the new heart comes through the spirit living within us. And the heart would not be set on you know, the, what we call you know, checklist Christianity. Well, I did this, so I'm good. I did this, so I'm good. We're not into checklist Christianity. We're in the whole transition of our thinking and our mind and our, our mindset. And you know, again, being spirit filled as opposed to being fleshly filled. Uh, verse seven talks a little bit about uh, you know, how we were, the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. We don't wanna be there. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it. So the mind cannot, you know, if you're governed by uh, the flesh, you cannot uh, submit to God's law. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. 
So this is again, with, you know, changing your thinking. So I wonder if that also speaks to people that are not Christians. Some people say, well, I, you know, I just want to live a, a, good, a good life. I want to follow some rules. And, you know, I want to be a good person. And sometimes people talk that way, not usually of themselves, but, oh, you know, my grandmother, she, she was never a Christian, but she was kind and she was loving and she was see, sweet and she was serving and she was giving and she never really got angry. You know, just all these things that she was a good person. But even in, when you do good, certainly there's still the, the, the flesh, maybe sometimes when you do sin or in the way you think or your attitude or your motivation or your humility, there's all kinds of things that, that affect the way we live. And so even what appears to be our good deeds, you know, God doesn't look at them and say, oh, well, you know, you are good enough because we're never good enough. And that's why, again, in the Old Testament, you know, it says even our good deeds are as filthy rags before God because we're not that good. You know, we can never be that good. And the only way I can feel like I'm that good is when I compare myself with somebody like Mark and I say, wow, I feel like I'm pretty good compared to Mark. But, you know, I'm not that good when I compare myself to God, his perfection. I feel like, and I see, I have fallen so short, so, so, so uh, failing towards God's standard that I, that I no longer can feel justified to myself. So even the best grandma is still not good in God's sight on their own. Right. There's by themselves. And, and Romans 3 talked about that, right? There's no one who does go good, no, not one. Now, some people have some good deeds along the way, but they don't have an overall, you know, we'd say the perfect life, you know. Right. So, there are no perfect lives, is there? Right. So verse 10 says, if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, again, we're, we're condemned because of our sin, but the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. So the Spirit transitions us into life. Verse 11, and if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, again, this whole thing of your mindset, living in you, he who has raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. So as we transition our thinking uh, to be uh, more spiritual and we have Christ living in us, it changes our entire status, doesn't it? Right. So it's interesting here, and Paul does this quite often, even in some of the other letters he writes. In verse 11, it talks about the Spirit who raised Christ from the dead. So this would be the Holy Spirit. And so Christ actually didn't raise himself from the dead. God is the one who raised Christ through the Spirit. And so he's just trying to maybe emphasize the power available to us. It's the same Spirit, that same powerful being that raised Christ from the dead can raise us from the death of sin and the control of sin, the power of sin, because we think about what is the power of death? I mean, when you're dead, where is, where is life? Well, there's no life to be found. You know, really nobody has hope once they're dead. So through the power of Christ, he raised people from the dead. The Spirit of God worked in others, even the Old Testament, the apostles can raise people from the dead. That same Spirit that raises literally a dead person that's been dead for like three days or something like that, raises them up. That spirit works in our life, a very powerful spirit to raise us from death of sin, death of the world, death of the control, even death of the feeling of condemnation gives us life because that's the power. The power so is spiritual in Spiritual life becomes, uh, spiritual death becomes spiritual life. Right. And the spirit takes us there. Right. And the power is there available to us to access, you know, this power to make the transition. And then the rest of the chapter talks about this spirit now is living within us. It's not like, you know, the spirit just said, oh, Mark, you're forgiven. You're okay. And then he goes away and says, try a little harder. Good luck, Mark. Um, you know, I'll see you when you get to heaven. No, the spirit continues every day to help us to overcome, to walk in his way, to bear fruit in our life of righteousness to God for his glory, the fruit of the spirit. So the spirit's continuing in our life Every step we take in life, the Spirit's with us. And he's really spending the rest of the chapter saying, we need to follow. The Spirit's leading us. We need to follow. The Spirit's directing us. Mm -hmm. We need to listen and follow the direction. Now, we can choose not to, though. The Spirit can be leading us saying, hey, come this way. This is the way of righteousness, the way that's right. And we, I don't know, I think I'm going to turn my own way. And so sometimes we do turn back to the way of the flesh, the way of the world. But the Spirit's still saying, come Follow me. And in that spirit, again, we, we read it over and over again in this chapter, that there's freedom in that. Verse 14, 
For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. And it's a great thing to be a child of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Again, even when you fail, you still have to live in fear of condemnation. But rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. So we become sons of God, sons, uh, uh, children of God, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. And Abba, that's a term that means daddy. Right. right. So there's an intimacy that we have with God that we can say, Daddy, Daddy, you know, in that intimate way because we are sons of God with the Spirit right. living in us. So it's a much different relationship, certainly, than the people of the Old Testament knew. Because in the Old Testament, um, you know, God revealed himself and his name was Jehovah, maybe closer to the Hebrew would be Yahweh. Uh, again, it would be a term that we don't really know very well. Uh, don't really even know how to speak it. We don't know really what the what the right pronunciation would be. But in the Old Testament, uh, in the in our scriptures, uh, it always comes up Lord L O R D all in caps, and that is this Yahweh. And so the Jewish people didn't even want to say the word Yahweh. That's why it's not found in the Old Testament. I mean, it's mentioned once in a while. What's God's name? It says Yahweh, but then the they rest don't of the time, speak the word, right? Yeah. Because that's how holy, how distant God is. Like we can't even, we can't even call his name. And now Jesus is saying, you can call, you don't even have to call him Yahweh or Mr. Yahweh or Master Yahweh or King or President. You can just call him Dad. Hey, Dad. People are like, what? I mean, what other religion in the world that can you call your God, you know, hey, hey, Dad, hey, Father, you know, this closeness, intimacy, you know, all the other religions are you're very fearful of of this deity because he's just ready to strike you dead or to condemn you god is so opposite he's done everything he could possibly do to set us free from condemnation to remove that guilt and the punishment he's not eager to see anyone suffer anyone go to hell anyone to be condemned he is so eager and willing and wanting for us to be in a close, personal, intimate relationship with him. And so he's done all of the sacrifice. He's done all of the work so that he could bring us close to him. And so this is the, the beauty of this Abba Father being close to him. But the interesting thing is in that verse, it says um, that you know we have to be in Christ to do that. And being in Christ means we're led by the Spirit. And so again, if we, if we refuse to follow the Spirit, I mean, there's Christians that have said, well, I'm not going to follow Christ anymore. And so they wander away. But if they're not following Christ, they're not into that relationship. The Spirit does not continue to live in them. And they can no longer call on God as Abba Father because they're not living in the Spirit. Right. We have an obligation, it talks about in verse 12, an obligation to put to death the misdeeds of the body right. so that we may live. And to do that, again, we talk, you go back to Romans 6, verse 3, you're buried with Christ in baptism. You, you rise in newness of life and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and this Holy Spirit now we are allowing to guide us. We are asking the Spirit to guide us. And then you know, we put ourselves in, in subjection to the Spirit. So I have, a, I have a question. We don't have this on the slide, but the next verse is verse 16. And there it says, the Spirit himself, this is the Holy Spirit. So it says the Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. So God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is going to reassure us in our spirit. So there's something inside of us the Spirit's going to reassure us. So the question is, how does he do that? Because I think a lot of people would say this, I have this warm, fuzzy, good feeling going on inside my heart, and I just think, I believe God loves me, and God accepts me, and I'm one of his just because these butterflies I have. It's almost like falling in love when you're in the seventh grade. You know, it's like, oh, you know, his, it must be God's Spirit testifying with my spirit that I'm a Christian, that I'm saved, that I'm going to heaven. So it's a warm, fuzzy feeling. Do you think that's how God's Spirit testifies with our spirit? If not, how would God's Spirit testify? Well, the Spirit works through us and changes our life. Okay. And changes, you know, again, takes us away from a life of sin and death, you know, spiritual death, and takes us to a different place. But we've got to be led by the Spirit. It's not the warm, fuzzy feeling. It's the idea, peace comes with that, of course, but the idea that, you know, we have to understand what God wants from us. You know, again, that uh, verse 12 talks about an obligation. So we have the Spirit in us. Now we have an obligation to live according to the Spirit. Right. 
that will give you a good feeling, but it's not the good feeling that should be guiding us. The Spirit, through the Word, is going to give us the knowledge and the power, but it can't be just an emotional la-la thing. Right. You have to have an intellectual connection to God's Word. You have to have an emotional connection with God's uh, Spirit, and together those work to change a life. Again, we are in the life-changing business. We have our lives changed because of the Spirit living in us. That's the reflection of, you know, right. you know and you should have a good feeling from that. Right. So a good feeling is not a bad thing to have, and, uh, you know, having the, uh, the peace of God is certainly part of this promise. Right. So you explain that very well, that there's a balance between knowing what the Spirit says, so we know that the Holy Scriptures are given through the inspiration of the Spirit. The Spirit has communicated with us through the Bible, and so that's how we can have assurance, because there may be some days where I, I, don't, I don't even feel saved, but then I can read the Scriptures and say, it's not just a feeling. You know, it says right here that I am saved. I'm a part of God's family. But then it's not only just knowing what the Scripture says, you know, intellectually, then it's living according to the Spirit, following Him, and bearing fruit of the Spirit. And so that's how I have confidence. And that's, again, you were saying where the peace and, and the knowing really comes into connection with even our feelings to say, you know, I know I'm in Christ because I'm following God's Word. I'm not always doing it perfectly, but I'm trying to grow. I'm trying to listen. I'm trying to follow. I'm trying to obey God, but it's really the Spirit leading me. Right, trying and, to live according to the Spirit is what your goal is. That's right. our goal, to try to live according to the Spirit right. so that we can have that life. Because again, some people in the world, and maybe even in churches some places, they may say, well, I just follow what the Spirit, do you ever study the Bible? No, I don't read the Bible at all. I just follow the Spirit, which means what? I just follow good feelings. That almost becomes my own reasoning, my own intellectual, you know, and somehow God's going to work miraculously in my life. Although He's given me the directives, but I feel like, well, I don't want to read the instructions. I'm just going to wait for God to speak to my heart from above. And then you become a God unto yourself. Right. And you are the God of your life, and you're defeating the, you know, the whole Spirit. Right. So there's got to be a balance of there, knowing yeah. God's Word and also listening as the Spirit leads us. Growing with that. Growing yeah. through it. Yep. Verse 18 starts talking yep. about uh, suffering and, and glory. Now we know at that time, when the time that was written, there were persecutions going on and people were dying because of Christ and people were being persecuted because of Christ. When you get into slide, um, or verse 19, which is the next slide, it talks about um, this, uh, this frustration that's going on. And you read this, it's almost like talking about today because the frustrations today are right. pretty high. But of course, it was many years ago, verse 19, for the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. Um, so this creation subject to frustration, what are, we, what are we getting to in here? So it seems like in, initially in the beginning, paradise. God wanted us all to live in a world, I guess ideally, of perfection. Then when man sinned, there was consequences to sin. Now man could have sinned and God could have just said, well, you know, they'll just have to you know, try to work it out for themselves. And so people would not feel guilt. You know, they would not feel the consequences of sin. So God said, you're going to feel guilt and you're going to have consequences. So this is saying God allowed things to happen in the world. I mean, it could be everything from disease. It could be talking about death. It could be talking about weather patterns. It could be talking about interpersonal relationships. It could be talking about wars. It could be talking about all kinds of things that, that make people uh, frustrated, uncomfortable. And so God's saying, hopefully through that, they're going to seek him. They're going to be looking for him. Because if he left it all that we're going to live in kind of in a, in a world of peace and perfection, even with our sin, we're not seeking God. So what's going to happen when we die? We're going to die with our sin and we're going to be lost eternally. So God does want, especially those people that are not living according to his word, to go through struggle, to go through pain, to go through difficulties. Because that's a lot of times when people do turn to the Lord. It's usually not in times of affluence and ease and happiness and you know, partying and, you know, when everything's going well, very few people 
seek the Lord. They just think, this is it. This is the good life, and I'm going to enjoy it. So, so this should be the perfect time in our time right now in 2000, whatever, 20, right. that we should be telling the message of Christ even more so, because the earth is in these pains. Uh, verse 22 says, we know that the whole creation has been growing as in pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And of course, when this was written, and we're talking about 2,000 years ago, but we have this whole creation groaning now in verse 23, not the only, only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship. Now we have been adopted, we know that, but the transition is not complete until we're with Him. Uh, the redemption of our bodies. So we're groaning inwardly, the, the, things of the world, the things of the earth, the, the trauma and drama that we're currently going through and probably have always been through, it seems to be heightened right now, but all of this should be pushing us toward God, shouldn't it? it right. So again, even as a Christian, these difficulties, what may that do? That would make us think, I am longing for heaven more now than I was earlier in my life, right? Not just because I'm getting older, but because I realize, yeah, this world is broken that there's not a lot of you know, joy and peace and happiness in the world system. Now, God certainly has created a beautiful earth, you know, animals and sunsets and trees, and, you know, all kinds of things we can enjoy in life. He made it as a paradise. And so, but we know that, that things are broken in the world and kind of the more difficult it becomes in the world, the more we're longing to be God, I just want to be free. I want to be released from this. I want to go to the better place. People in the world don't think that way. They think, how am I going to make it through today? Because this world is the only hope I have. Mm -hmm. And they may be thinking, some people may literally be thinking, when I die, I either don't know what's going to happen, or I may actually be condemned. I may be separated from God. For, I'm not going to think about that. I don't want to think about dying and being condemned. So I'm, I'm, I'm just going to live today and enjoy today. And, but when there's not a lot of joy in the world, you know, because again, you're saying there's struggles in our world now, but there's always been struggles, whether it be, you know, in times of war or in times of conflict or in times of, you know, political upheaval or, you know, just all kinds of things that, that can happen either nationally, globally, or even personally in our own lives, just stuff that happens in my home or my work or my neighborhood. Or So the whole world is groaning, is right. what it says here, but we as Christians, we grow grown inwardly as we wait eagerly right. for the completion of the adoption with Christ. It doesn't say this is wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship. And in other words, you know, our separation from earth, our death on earth, so that we can be uh, forever with God, waiting for eagerly awaiting for our adoption to sonship and the redemption of our body. So even though this world is crazy at times, I, I'm saying it's upside down right now because this way I feel the world is upside down. And uh, you know, so it makes me as a Christian wait eagerly for that transition to be right. with God. Get out of this world, right? Right. So that's what verse 24 says, for in this hope we are saved. So yeah. we, we're, we're, we're looking forward to it. If we didn't have the hope, why would we hang on? Why would we continue to follow Christ? Mm -hmm. But the hope is, you know, we can read all the way to the end of the book of Revelation, for instance, that describes what heaven is going to be like. And we say, boy, that's the place I want to go to where there's no more pain or sorrow, no more death, no more crying. Uh, it's going to be a, a place of just joy and happiness and praise. And it's going to be just the most wonderful place you could ever imagine. And so this is what we're hoping for. Yeah. Uh, if there wasn't that to look forward to, then be pretty painful life, wouldn't it? Right, just be difficult. <laughs> we just have to suffer through whatever we're going through. So the world will be right side up then. When we <laughs> yeah. Uh, 25, we don't have a chart for that either, but it says, but if we hope for what we don't have, we wait for it patiently. And the next, uh, verse 20, 26, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Um, do you ever have a time when you don't know what to pray for? I mean, I remember times in my life where, you know, all the circuits were jammed and, you know, just unable to even think of a conscious thought sometimes. You're just going through the motions to do what you have to do and there's trauma and drama in your life and maybe there's pain and there's suffering and there's uh, sickness and death and you know there's a times in our life when we just don't know how to pray or what to pray for or, you know what outcome that we're seeking we don't even know. Now, I've had times like that in my life I don't know if you have or not but it says the Spirit intercedes for us. Right. And, and 
says that prayer for us or intercedes or talks to God for us because we don't even know what to say. And um, I think one of the phrases that I've used before, you know, Lord have mercy. And, and when I don't know what to pray for, I say that probably more often than I should, but because I don't know what to say. Right. And I know the Spirit's interceding for me because it says so right here. Right. Well, we don't always know what's best and partly because we don't know what the future is. Uh, so it's, it's difficult for us to pray, but maybe the Spirit sees our heart instead of listening to our words. So sometimes we may, you know, be praying for a certain situation. So, I mean, some situations are more traumatic than others. You know, we may think of maybe somebody we, we know that's a loved one and we're praying maybe for their, for their healing, right? So they're sick and we pray for their healing, but we say, Lord, I don't even know what's best, you know? So, so we're, we're praying for one thing, but what the outcome may be. One, one time, you know, this happened a few times, but one, it's a situation where maybe you're thinking about a new job or maybe you're being offered a promotion at work and you think, well, the promotion sounds good on the outside because, you know, maybe I'm getting more money, a, a better position, but maybe that's going to take me away from my family. It's going to be more responsibility. Maybe I'm going to have more worries when I'm at home about my job. So do I really need that stress? So like, Lord, you know, Lord, I really want this job. But, you know, I really love my family, but I really want the job. And so, so what the Spirit hears us saying all the time is we want, I want the promotion. But the Spirit, I want, may, I want, I want. The Spirit yeah. may go to the Father and says, he's saying he wants the promotion, but I know his heart. He really wants to spend time with his family. And if he gets the promotion, it's going to take him away from his family. And then when he's home with his family, what's he thinking about? He's thinking about that work, oh, that, the deadline's tomorrow, you know, and now, you know, he doesn't need that. He can't handle that. You know what I mean? So... Mm -hmm. So he, he, he's thinking about what we really need. And, and again, looking at the future, you know, you think about that. Yeah. You may get a promotion from maybe, you know, lower management to middle management. And you think you really need that and you want that. But what you don't know is that in six months, they're laying off all of the middle management. So you get the promo promotion to middle management. You finally got what you've wanted. In six months, you're out of a job. Yeah. As opposed to the, the answer is no, and you think, oh, I'm so disappointed. I get Then six months, all the middle management, you go, wow, I'm glad that I didn't get that yeah. job. Although I want it, I begged for it, but the Spirit said, uh, no, we know what's best. In, in mid-career, I began a, a whole way, new way of thinking based on that. Um, I used to hope and pray for you know, the next job, the next promotion, the next opportunity. But later, or you know, mid-career through the end, I began to pray for, God, you put me where you want to put me. If I get that promotion or a new job, I say, thank you, Lord. And if I don't get that new promotion job, or I, I say, thank you, Lord. And I actually said that in an interview one time. He said, well, if you don't get this job, you know, I, I, say, I, say, I say, thank you, Lord, either way. I didn't get that job, but it put me in a better position for what I did get later on. Right. So I, I gave up wishing and hoping for things that I thought I needed and, and took it and put it in God's hands. That was a hard transition to make, right. but it, it was necessary because of the frustration level I was feeling when God said no. So I said, okay, I will thank you no matter what. Right. But then again, sometimes maybe we do have so much pain in our life that again, we don't know what to pray or to say. And so the Holy Spirit, you know, we may just say, God, I know what to say, I'm so mad. Or I'm kind of frustrated with this situation. Or God, I'm disappointed in you. I mean, yeah. to be honest, is pe have people ever said that? I mean, have you ever read the Psalms? I mean, isn't that what it comes out sometimes? Lord, where are you? Lord, you know, why have you put me in this position? I'm such despair and distress and I'm at the pit and, you know, my soul has gone down to Sheol. You know what I mean? It just goes on and on of, you know, his desperation and feeling like, God, why have you abandoned me? Well, God mm -hmm. did not abandon him, you know, so uh, well, the answer is right that. here, though. Yeah. So he's being honest with God. Yeah. And, and so that's his feelings and emotions. But when you get down to you know what God has promised in verse 28 is so clear on this. Right. And this is to me another one of those affirming statements. When you read Romans 8, the, the, the things that they say, verse 28, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. That's us who have been called according to his purpose. That's me and you. That's all those who answered the call, who were buried with Christ in baptism, and rose in the newness of life. These are the people he has called according to his people. What happens? All things work together for good right. for those who love him. And, and that's just a, uh, it takes all the doubt away. All things work together for good for God, uh, you know, for those who were called according to his purpose. Right. 
So I got to quit worrying about, I don't have to worry anymore. Right. Because I already know the answer. For those God... For, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. So there's this whole idea that the things are going to work out. Right. And we trust that. We need to trust that, hard to trust that. Yeah. That's a transition, though, that we can make as we mentor in Christ. It's, okay, letting go of that and saying, I know that all things work together for good. So maybe there's a, a correlation between... 20, 28 and 29. So God's going to work all things out. There's two things that he says we must do. One is we must love God and that, that we must follow his purpose for our life and be willing to do that. So we've been called according to his purpose, but we must acknowledge that. You know, conform and, and to the image that. of his son. Right. Okay. That's our job. Our job is conform to the image of his son. Right. And I was thinking, verse 29, being conformed to the image of his son you know, we just finished talking about sometimes difficulties and challenges come. Why are they coming? Because maybe it's through those times also we're being conformed to the image of his son. Because you remember, you know, Jesus did not have an easy life, you know, especially when he was preaching and teaching. And so we don't know much about what had happened before he was 30 when he started his earthly ministry of going around teaching, preaching, healing, the disciples, training, you know, all of that. But we know when Jesus lived, he was not always accepted. He was not always loved. He was not always appreciated. He was not always worshipped. He was not always, uh, you know, the, the one that, uh, that people honored or respected or even tried to get along with. So it was not easy for him. So if we are going to be conformed to the image of Christ, that means maybe there's suffering we go through. When Jesus went through suffering, it was really to test him. Because the Bible says he was, you know, tempted or tested in all ways like we are. Yet he was without sin. And we, when we go through trials and difficulties, disappointments, you know, the death of a loved one, the loss of a job, bad news at the doctor's office regarding our health, just whatever it could be, we're going through difficult times, maybe in a relationship or with our family, our spouse, or just something going on. These things are helping us to become more like Christ, right? We're being strengthened, absolutely. Strengthened, and trusting yeah. more in God and, and uh, learning, you know, things like patience and and uh, you know, gentleness and serving and praying for our enemies, just whatever it could be, we're, we're being, coming more and more yeah, like we're Christ. transitioning, aren't we? Slowly over time, but you know, bit by bit, he's, he's getting to us. Uh, 30 is not, a, we don't have a slide for this, but those he predestined, he also called, that's us. Those he called, he also justified, again, that's us. Those he justified, he also glorified. So th that's what he's saying about us in verse 31. And we do have a slide for that. What then shall we say in response to these things? And this is another one of those affirming statements. If God is for us, who can be against us? I, I, it's a, one of those affirming statements that, you know, make me, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah that's, a, that's something you can just, you know, shout out. He who did not know, who, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? So he, he, we're promised this package that we're going to be, you know, we're going to be pulled together to be in Christ's image right. and that the Spirit's going to be with us in doing that. And we're going to make this transition and, and become justified and glorified. Right. And I know sometimes life can be difficult. And, you know, I'm not certainly not downplaying anything that people have gone through in their life. Um, you know, sometimes people talk about, uh, you know, tragedies or maybe even abuse that's happened. And certainly that is horrific. But, you know, I, I think... Uh, what you're saying, verse 31 and 32, speaks to the answer, the question that people ask, um, if God is good, then maybe he's not loving, or maybe God is loving, but he's not all-powerful, right? So I think verse 31 says, God is all-powerful, God is in control, mm -hmm. and he is able to work everything out. But maybe the problem is he doesn't want to. He's not willing to. He, Mark, he just doesn't love you enough. He's just not that concerned about you. He's kind of a little more hands-off. Uh, he's somebody who doesn't really care. Maybe he's a little bit apathetic. On the contrary, he, right. is, he was all about shaping me. Right. So Everything verse, in my life is shaping me. Right. Every good and bad thing in my life has shaped me into the person I am. Right. So God is all-powerful. Verse 32 says, yeah, but God loves you so much that he's willing to give his own son. Well, if he loves you that much, then, you know, he's not going to... He's, he's not, not going to abandon off. me somewhere, right? right? 
Yeah, so I think that's answering both questions. God is all powerful and he's all loving. It's not one or the other. Yeah. He is both and he's working things out for us. And it may not always seem that way. I, so I'm not, again, downplaying people's disappointment, you know, of a, of a yeah. premature death of, of a loved one. You know, I know that's very, very difficult to go through or, uh, you know, some type of... Any kind of trauma or tragedy trauma. in our life yeah. is is difficult. And you can't take that away. No, it's a difficult thing you're going through. Absolutely. Right. But God is with us, isn't he? Right. Uh, you talk about verse 35, again, no chart for this, but who shall separate from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? And then you know, verse 37 gives it the answer. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So again, this statement is such a bold and affirming statement. All things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So there is nothing that can separate us from God. Right. No thing, no person, no... Right. No death, no illness, no nothing. Right. So ultimately no person. So we could say, you know, there's not some government official that can threaten us. Uh, there's no relationship like somebody we may know, a family member. Uh, there's not a situation, you know, and we may think of Job, you know, of death, a, a loss of your job, a loss of your estate and your finances, a loss of your future. Uh, no temptation. Satan cannot tempt us. Even in, in, in the weakest point we have in our life, Satan cannot tempt us to the point where we would sin and then wander away and be lost. So there's nothing, whether it be physical or a person or a spiritual force, there's nothing in all of creation that can separate us from God. Now, some people may read this and say, therefore, we are eternally secure, that since there's nothing that can separate us from God, we are, so I'm a Christian, I've, I've, I've become a Christian, I'm committed to following Christ, there's no way I can be lost now, right? There's no way that I can lose my salvation, it's eternally secure. Now, one For thing those is, that are in Christ Jesus. Those that are in Christ, right. Remain in me, he says right. many times, and Jesus says, remain in me, and right. I will remain in you. So we have to remain. Right. So God is going to protect us while we follow him, while we trust in him, while we listen to him, while the spirit continues to work, right? But in this list, it does not include us deciding. Now, some people say, well, you know, God does not allow, allow us to decide. He is predetermined and predestined, and you have no choice in the matter now. Um, you're saved, and you cannot get unsaved no matter what you do. But we can decide, I'm not following God anymore. I'm not listening to the Spirit. I'm going to go back into the world. I'm going to follow the, the way of the flesh. I'm going to live apart from Christ, live a sinful life. Uh, you know, I'm not going to worship God, honor God, read the Bible. I'm not going to pray. I'm not going to go to worship. I'm not going to do any of that. I'm just going to go back to the way I was before I was a Christian. And so it would be hard to say, well, that person is still saved because it says, it says there's nothing that's able to separate them. What this is saying, you know, as long as my desire is to follow God, there's nothing externally that can get in the way. There's nothing that can break that connection. There's nothing that can, that can destroy right. this but, grace. But that we can still Christ. walk away. We can willingly walk away from God right. and turn our back on God. That's not one of these things. You know. Right, it's not listed in here. So no. it's saying all we do is we, you know, continue to live for God. So Remain in me, yep. Jesus says. So 1 John chapter 1, probably quote this too often, but how could you quote a verse too often? Uh, you know, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, it's talking about Jesus, we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another in the blood of Jesus Christ, his son cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So we continue to to walk in the spirit, walk in the light, walk in God's word and his way, and, and we will be protected. And when we do sin, there's, there's still continued forgiveness through the blood of Christ. And so, so our, our, our goal then is to remain faithful because God is always going to remain faithful to his word. He's always going to remain faithful to us. He's always going to do what he's always promised to do. And so we can trust in him. And so we can be sure, we can trust in his future uh, that he has for us. And so we, we just continue uh, to understand what our role is in, in this relationship. And so I, 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 think the, I think part of chapter 8, you know, thinking about what we've studied so far all the way through is 
you're, you're finished reading this. Do you get do you get the feeling Paul is saying, um, yeah, we're just saved by grace, and therefore sin as much as you want. You remember that was chapter mm-hmm. six. You by know, no shall means, we right? continue to sin that grace may increase? Well, chapter eight is definitely saying no, because we are a new person. The Spirit's living within us, and we're going to bear fruit of the Spirit. We're not going to continue to living in, in the deeds of darkness. So. You know, again, people say, well, as a Christian, there is no law. There, you know, there is no, there is no uh, way of living. You just kind of live however you want in Christ. But, but no, there's, there's a standard that God has, and it has to do with relationship more than it has to do with, you know, a code of do's and don'ts. Uh, we, we know what the right thing to do is, but we are really free from, from law. The Spirit is now saying, live according to the Spirit. Now, again, are there good things and bad things that we should be doing? Yes. Why do we do that? Because of something written down? No, we do that because of love. We do that because of our relationship. Because the Spirit's living in us, and we're obligated to fulfill or live according to the Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Well, let's have a prayer, and following the prayer, we're going to have a song. Um, So let's uh, pray just before we uh, sing. Father, we thank you so much that you do love us, that you've given us your Spirit, You've given us your word, and we pray that as we continue to learn and grow and study, as we become more and more aware of how you would have us to live, the things that we should be doing and the things that we uh, should avoid doing, uh, we pray that you would give us the strength through your spirit that we can have discernment. Uh, We may be able to have a greater uh, trust in you for our life and for our future, that we may look forward to this Uh, beautiful resurrection, this beautiful life in eternal glory that you have planned and you have designed and you have promised. We pray that as we live in this world, we could be faithful to following uh, your word and your spirit and that other people may see you living in us and we can be be like a light that shines in a dark world, that we can be uh, a, a, a ray of hope that helps people that are discouraged and upset and feeling lost. And we can point people towards Christ for those people that feel burdened and feel guilty and feel like they have uh, no purpose. We pray that we can be your ambassadors and that we can share your love and we can share your plan and we can share uh, your hope. We pray that you would guide us and lead us. And more than anything, we pray that we, be, that we would be good followers of you. Because we know that you've made all the promises and, and uh, you are always going to be faithful. And so we pray that our trust and our obedience and our love and our uh, following you uh, would continue to, to grow and we would just become more and more like Jesus every day. We thank you so much that it was his love and his sacrifice uh, that gives us life and his resurrection and even the spirit that, that raised Christ from the dead lives within us. And we pray that power may be evident and we would be reminded of it and we would claim the victory in our life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.